So back to the beginning. Uh, I'm Allie, I'm a peds intern, um, and my journal club is on the effect of prophylactic paracetamol used at the time of vaccination on febrile reactions and antibody responses in children. And special thanks to Dr. Wynn, who is my advisor for this and helped me create this PowerPoint. Um, and we have no disclosures. So my objectives are to analyze the data in order to provide more accurate recommendations to our patients regarding the use of antipyretics with vaccines and then determine the risk versus benefits of using these with the vaccines and if it affects vaccine efficacy. And then brief, briefly review a couple statistical terminology. And then the article objectives are reduction of febrile reactions of 38 degrees Celsius or greater in the total vaccinated cohort, and then assessment of immunogenicity in the according to protocol cohort. And then PICO framework, which is used by practitioners to facilitate um, their literature search. The population is healthy infants. Intervention paracetamol use. Comparison is no paracetamol use. And then outcomes are the immunogenicity. So who, um, there's a bunch of authors listed here, but I would like to point out specifically that um, a couple of these authors are um, by the GlaxoSmithKline um, pharmaceutical company who um, provided the funding for this. In the when and where, so the study was completed in 10 medical centers in the Czech Republic. Um, the primary vaccination study went from September of 2006 to April of 2007. There was a small break in between to get some data points. Um, and then it restarted from July of 2007 until April of 2008. So I know this was several years ago, but I still felt that the information was pretty relevant, um, especially now with the emergence of a new vaccine coming along. Um, the why, so what we already know, we know fever is a normal inflammatory response to the body. It's produced mainly by IL-1 and TNF-alpha. It's associated with a heightened T cell activity, enhanced antigen recognition, and immune response. Paracetamol is a selective inhibitor of COX-2, which is secreted by B cells and needed for max antibody production. And we do know that Parents often prophylactically give their children antipyretics either before um, they come in for their vaccines or immediately after. And then this article assesses the effect of prophylactic administration of paracetamol at the time of vaccination and within the next 24 hours on febrile reactions and vaccine responses. The population was healthy infants 9 to 16 weeks at the time of enrollment and then 12 to 15 months at the time of their booster. They were excluded from the study if antipyretics were already required for some reason or another, um, if they had a contraindication to paracetamol, or if they'd already been previously vaccinated against um, the vaccines that were used in the study. And then moving on to the how or their methods. So eligible children were enrolled and randomly assigned into two groups. One of the groups received three doses of paracetamol that was administered every six to eight hours within 24 hours after each vaccine. And then the other group did not receive any paracetamol. Um, their control group did, receive, did not receive a placebo so it was obvious um, as to which treatment group they were assigned to. When the preliminary results of immunogenicity became available, administration at time of the booster um, of the paracetamol uh, halted. Therefore, results of the study were divided into three groups um, regarding the booster vaccine. So there were those who received prophylactic paracetamol prior to the primary and booster series, those who received it only prior to the primary series of vaccines, and then those who did not receive any at all. 
Each child enrolled in the study received the same sets of vaccines as listed here. Um, and then the first administration of paracetamol was given by um, clinic staff immediately after the vaccine. And then the second and third doses were administered at home by the parents every six to eight hours. The dosing was standardized based on weights and they concluded that the total daily dose of paracetamol use was 40 to 50 mix per kg. Um, and then the temperatures of the patients were measured rectally on the evening of the day of vaccine. And then in the morning in the evening on the first day after their vaccines, and then only in the evenings of the second and third days. And then parents were um, measuring their temperatures using thermometers that um, were supplied by the study. And both groups were allowed to use antipyretics at parental and study physician discretion, but the paracetamol was only allowed to be used six hours after the last dose in the treatment group. Um, and then diary cards um, were kept documenting symptoms and adverse events by parents. So they were looking at solicited events, so things that we expected to happen, um, such as like local symptoms like pain, redness, and swelling versus generalized symptoms, temperature, irregularities, fussiness, drowsiness, and loss of appetite. And these were documented from the day of vaccination and then three days after each vaccine dose. They were also looking at the unsolicited events. So these are symptoms or adverse events that um, we did not necessarily expect to uh, occur. And these were documented for 31 days each dose. Um, and blood samples were collected before the first dose and one month after primary vaccination, as well as before one month after the boosters. These serum immunoglobulin concentrations were measured using ELISA. This is a chart kind of laying out the study population. So um, there were 459 participants enrolled and vaccinated in the primary study. Then there were 414 in the booster. And then within the booster series, the participants from the group boosted after implementation of the amendment were not included in the group comparisons to reduce the bias there. And now for a little statistical sidetrack. Um, so I haven't had a statistics review in quite a while. So I know these terms are um, more basic, but I figured if I needed a um, little review on them, others might as well. So a confidence interval is how accurate the estimate is. And the width of the interval itself depends on variation in population size, um, or variation in the population, and then the sample size. So if you have a higher variation versus in a small sample size, you're going to have a wider confidence interval. And the three um, dots below are explaining how to actually calculate the confidence interval. Um, so if we have a 95 confidence interval, this means that we expect 95% of the population to contain the true mean. And when the, inter the confidence interval crosses one, it means that the results are not precise enough to be useful. For example, if you have a confidence interval that's 0 0.5 to 1.5, um, the study has no true validity as the results are not very significant. And then only a post hoc analysis, which I chose because you'll see a little later on that this study does utilize um, a post hoc analysis towards the end. Um, so it's used when you reject the null hypothesis. So it's when you find a statistically significant result and need to determine where the differences truly come from. So there are several different um, tests that you can use, and these are the three kind of listed out here. So moving on to the results. Um, first, regarding the fever, so 
After the primary vaccination, um, only one participant in the prophylactic group, so that receiving the paracetamol, had a temperature greater than 103.1 Fahrenheit versus three participants in the um, non-paracetamol group that had the temperature of 103.1 or higher. So when you break that down, um, when looking at just a true fever, 100.4 Fahrenheit, um, in the primary series, those that received paracetamol, um, there was 42% of those um, patients who had a true, true fever, and then versus 66% in the those that did not receive paracetamol. And then when looking at the booster series, 36% of those um, that received paracetamol had a true fever versus 58% in those that did not um, receive paracetamol. And this was a little better explained um, using this chart from the study. So try to point. Um, so the difference in the temperatures were significant and the fever was mainly reduced within the first 24 hours after the vaccine. So you can see here, this first bar is paracetamol use, and then the second is no paracetamol use. And there is only a significant difference within that day zero or the first day after vaccinations. All right, and then moving on with the rest of the findings. So regarding the antibody response, so the percentage of children with adequate antibody concentrations was significantly lower in the paracetamol group during the primary vaccinations. And then for a number of serotypes, the mean antibody concentrations were significantly lower in the paracetamol group after primary and booster series. And then just of note, the anti-rota was within the same range between both groups. And then before booster series, there were lower antibodies detected for all serotypes in the paracetamol group versus the non-paracetamol group. Um, and I'll explain these a little bit for um, some of the charts that were provided in the study. Um, but looking at the symptoms that the parents had kept a diary of, so the grade three or the more severe symptoms, they were graded from zero to three, zero being none, three being more severe. Um, they were all uncommon, uh, but there were lower rates in the paracetamol group, um, but they weren't statistically significant. Um, of note, there was no cases of seizures reported in the entire follow-up period, even with these um, reports of fevers. These tables that kind of describe the results. So just a disclaimer, I thought um, the article's results and these tables were a little bit tricky in trying to um, kind of decipher what they truly meant. So I'm going to try to um, break it down and kind of make it clear and concise as possible. So for table one at the top, it's looking at the anti-pneumococcal IgG after primary vaccinations. So the cutoff to be considered immunogenic was greater than 0.2 micrograms per milliliter, which you see over here and here. Um, so the percentage of children with antibody concentrations greater than 0.2 against specifically the serotype 6B um, was significantly lower in the paracetamol group than in the non-paracetamol group. So this column or row here. And then when you look at the anti-pneumococcal antibodies against all 10 serotypes, it was significantly decreased in the paracetamol group versus the non-paracetamol group. So that's this last part over here versus here. So there wasn't a huge difference in the percentage in meeting that threshold for being considered immunogenic in both groups. But when you look at the average antibody concentration, there is a noticeable difference between the two. Um, it is 
just statistically significant, but I'm not sure, entirely sure about the clinical significance of that. Um, and then moving on to table two here, it's looking at the effectiveness of antibodies versus the total concentration of antibodies. Um, so effectiveness versus the total concentration. Um, so there was a significantly higher antibody function in these three serotypes in the non-paracetamol group, and then a significantly higher antibody concentration in these two sero serotypes in the non-paracetamol groups. So in the non-paracetamol group over here, um, there was higher antibody concentrations and higher antibody effectiveness. And just as a reminder, this is for the primary vaccination series. Moving on, so table three um, is looking more at the specific antigen antibody responses for the primary vaccination. Um, so the serotype uh, or the seroprotective cutoffs for each group are listed over here. Um, so the Hib antigen, which is the first two you see, um, was significantly higher in the non-paracetamol group in both seropro concentrations and antibody concentrations. Whereas with diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, the antibody concentration, concentrations were all significantly higher in the non-paracetamol group, but not statistically different um, in the seroprotection. And this is um, table four. So this table is again looking at the anti-pneumococcal antibodies one month after a booster vaccine. So as before it was looking at the primary and now it's looking at the booster. Um, so for, there was a significantly higher average antibody concentration in the non-paracetamol group, but both groups were considered to be immune according to the concentration cutoff of 0.2. Um, so the only significant difference was in the amount of antibody present within the booster series, which is in this column over here. In table five, um, is looking at antibody effectiveness versus the mean antibody concentration. So in general, um, significantly higher average antibody concentrations were found in the non-paracetamol group. And then there was no significant differences in the antibody effectiveness between the groups. So if we think back to the primary vaccination um, results, there was a significant difference in a few of those serotypes for the antibody effectiveness, whereas there is not now in the booster series. Then this table is breaking down the specific antigens again that was tested for in the booster series one month after the vaccination. So it's essentially the same as the table three that was listed previously for the primary um, vaccines. For the booster, all groups were considered to be seroprotective regardless of paracetamol use. So there was no difference in the percentage of seroprotection. So that's um, found here, here, and here. Um, and when we think back to the primary results, the, there was um, differences specifically in the Hib antigen that was um, had a higher serum protection. So recapping some of their objectives. So they, the primary objective was to make the reduction in febrile reactions at 38 degrees Celsius or greater on day zero to three when prophylactic paracetamol was administered compared to no use of antipyretics. So both of these studies um, met their objectives since the lower limit of the 95 interval was um, on the group difference was greater than zero. 
This led them to their hypothesis that paracetamol maximally interferes with vaccine responses if administered early, whereas if used therapeutically once fevered and the corresponding inflammatory signals have been established, its effect can be expected to be smaller. Um, which also led them to do a um, post hoc analysis using another study that was done in 2009 that evaluated the immunogenicity of two different vaccines um, with paracetamol use. So that showed that the antibody concentration was reduced when paracetamol was used on the day of vaccination. And now taking a look at some potential issues or biases. Um, so internal validity, the study was not blind um, as the control group did not receive a placebo. Um, the study was funded by GlaxoSmithKline, as I had mentioned previously, which is a large pharmaceutical company. Um, and they made all of the vaccines and medications that was used in the study. Some authors were employees of this company. Um, and then parents in the study were the ones checking the temperatures at home and dosing the second and third doses of paracetamol, which um, leaves room for some error or differences among um, patients. And then the external validity. So the study population um, was in the Czech Republic. So, which I've not been there, but I am sure it is much different than the population here um, in the southwestern part of, of Virginia. Um, and then vaccine differences. So, whether it's the formulation, the ages at which they were carried out, or clinical guidelines um, may be different from those um, here in the US as they are in Europe. And then lack of diversity does not correlate with our patient population as only um, one participant was not white. Let's see. So in overview, paracetamol was effective in lowering temperatures post-vaccinations. However, mild to moderate febrile reactions that did occur were of little concern. Um, and as I'd mentioned earlier, there were no febrile seizures um, recorded in the study period, so it was not able to assist the prevention of these. Um, and then substantial reduction in primary antibody response to eat these 10 pneumococcal conjugate vaccine serotypes, Hib, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus antigens with paracetamol. The differences between groups receiving or not receiving paracetamol decrease after boosting, suggesting higher effect of paracetamol on B cell differentiation into plasma cells than into memory cells. So this led them to their hypothesis that um, prophylactic paracetamol interfered with the early interactions between dendritic B and T cells, possibly through a reduction of inflammatory signals at the site of an injection. Do you agree with the author's conclusion? Um, personally, I agree with their conclusions. So according to their evidence that they presented, there was a more significant effect when using paracetamol um, earlier on rather than throughout um, the 24 hours or few days after giving the, getting the vaccines. And how does this affect or change the practice? So personally, um, I'm going to continue to discourage the use of antipyretics at the time of vaccinations. However, I'll be more um, aware and more specific to kind of encourage parents to um, not give them their children um, the antipyretics until they have at least shown symptoms or signs or symptoms of having an antibody response or an immune response rather than giving them um, the medication to prevent that from happening. 
just to be sure that they don't blunt any of the um, vaccine responses there. Um, so would, do you all have any, um, do you agree or with their conclusions or do you have any thoughts on how this could change or not change, I guess, um, your practice? Um, so good job presenting this. This is an interesting study. When I looked over it, their primary objective was was fairly impressive. Um, if you look at the numbers needed to, to treat to actually reduce fever, um, and it, it's less than ten for to at least thirty eight degrees um, after a patient has been vaccinated. I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. I mean, you go from a forty percent, uh, you come from a sixty percent, you know, having fevers down to uh, thirty or forty percent of the patients. Um, so, and it's interesting how they put that as one objective, and then the second one was more the immunogenistic aspect of their their study. But what I was asking you about with the the blinding and not blinding, what what are some limitations? You said scientifically, it's more scientifically when you when you blind someone, but what could be some issues that could skew your data when you have? families who are who are responsible for recording if they have fever and the ones that you're actually giving the medicine to and they know they're giving them medicine to is that is that better for you to answer? yeah yeah so i just think that um with the parents being the ones that were um kind of doing all of the recording and measuring of their temperatures if they know that they're giving their child um Tylenol versus if they know that they're not getting them Tylenol, they may be, um, I don't know. I, I would hate yeah, to say yeah. that. They, <laughs> I don't want to make right, them say that they're like. You're right. You uh, can't account for that. Altering, the, yeah. The, study cannot, the authors cannot account for that, that type of biases where it's reporting biases. So that's a very good point. Um, and then the second, the second aspect of the study was the immune system focus so what is your you know just because you have a certain titer does that mean that they're more likely to become infective infected with a one of the one of the pathogens that they've been vaccinated for do we do we know that did the authors elaborate on that yeah that's another thing i wasn't entirely sure um or if they did mention it i missed it but where they came up with those numbers um as far as like whether they were um, considered to be immunogenic or whatnot is like the 0 0.2 cutoff and things. Um, so I guess that would be something else to look into where they got those numbers from and how accurate that is at predicting whether they're going to be immune to those things or not. Um, yeah, because where this comes, you know, to be able to use this study in the heat of the moment with the discussion with a mother who is adamant about giving their child Tylenol, I don't know if this study would be one that I would take a, a stand against, you know, if they were adamant of wanting to do it, I, mean, I think it would be still very reasonable for them to treat post post vaccine. Um, and I, I'd like to hear from others and what their thoughts were, but I think there's some limitations with the, with the study and what's being reported. And we don't know that, you know, just because they have a lower titer makes them more likely necessarily with just this study. Yeah, this absolutely. Is, this is definitely interesting because if there is some sort of, you know, unexplained immunomodulatory effect of the of Tylenol um, and teasing that out, and this was a 2009 study and I looked at kind of attempted systematic reviews on this subject and it's it's still kind of being teased out of what what may be going on here yeah yeah absolutely i agree um yeah i don't know that i would again base all of my evidence off of this particular study i i guess i would use it more so that it, it was it could potentially um like i said within the first uh at the when paracetamol was given at the time of vaccines, it was found to kind of be um, have higher numbers, I guess, in changing that response. So I guess that's where I would get kind of my swaying uh, in parents was giving them that, that data. But yeah, I agree. Definitely more research should be done and things to make it 
and more reliable. And then you mentioned post hoc analysis. What are what is one of the limit limitations with doing that, or one of the problems with doing several post hoc analyses on your data? Um, so what I remember from statistics was it's kind of like you're trying to find significance in comparisons to your results. Um, is is that what you're kind of? You're you're heading in the right path, but keep going. <laughs> um, so I guess the more you look for something, the more that you're going to find with um, the differences or significance of the results. Yeah, so you, the more you analyze your data, the more likely you're going to find something, but you're compromising the statistical significance by overanalyzing your data. Your p-value may shift even further, say, than from 0.05. If you've done mega analysis and multiple post hoc analysis, you're going to need to adjust for that and then move your p-value even further. Maybe what would be statistically significant instead of 0 0.05, maybe 0 0.003 or so. But it's, it's one thing to consider, especially when you design a study um, and you're not sure how to interpret your data, they may be a, a temptation to further analyze and see what you can kind of kind of milking your data and see what you can find. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I agree with what Dr. Ward was saying. I don't know that this necessarily influences how a council parents with um, on routine um, administration of Tylenol around the time of vaccine. I, I do think, and Ali mentioned this a little bit, but I think it's interesting that certainly there was a lot of um, statistically significant findings after the primary dose. But if you look at the um, reactions after the booster, that difference kind of diminished in a lot of the measures that they found. Um, I agree that it would be interesting to see what the story is behind that cutoff that they did use, um, that 0.2 micrograms per milliliter concentration, but if you look at the percentage of children who, um, the difference in the percentage of children who were appropriately um, immunized, there really isn't a statistically significant difference when looking at that measure between the two groups, whereas even if there is a difference in the um, mean um, antibody concentration. So with the statistically significant difference in mean antibody concentration, I think um, it's hard to say what that means clinically, if there is a clinically significant difference, especially when you're thinking about, you know, things like diphtheria or polio that we may not be seeing uh, a whole lot of anyways, um, sort of post-introduction uh, of, I mean, of uh, vaccines. Um, so I do think it's a really interesting um, article, and I think there's a lot of theoretical questions that it poses, but it's still unclear to me how much of it is clinically um, significant. And to comment on, on Yas's comment and Ali's comment on uh, the COVID vaccine, I actually had a text from my dad last night about my grandmother being vaccinated and whether or not she should take uh, prophylactic antipyretic. So it's definitely something that is um, on the minds of a lot of people now that we, we do have a new vaccine out. So thank you, Ali. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wing, for that. Ali, you touched on confidence intervals. What was your thoughts on the confidence intervals with the immune part of the study? Table one. Table one. Oh, okay. Where they're comparing your prophylactic and your non-prophylactic. So if they got the medicine versus not, and then you see their um, the concentrations, and then afterwards you see your 95% confidence interval. So for serotype 1, you're 94.5 to 99. Um, and then you compare that to your, they didn't get the medicine. I'd say they're pretty, it's a pretty narrow confidence interval. It's not super wide. That was one thing I noticed with this study is that it looked like the, the confidence intervals were, were fairly narrow um, across all of the measurements. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see that now. Yeah. 
but it's, it's an important topic because sometimes people can sneak things in or, or it can be a little misleading with their data and, and seeing where the confidence interval is because it can be very broad. If you see that, that's one thing you want to be cautious about it when you're interpreting how the results that the authors are kind of concluding. Um, there, there may be issues with that. Pack factors of the journal. So you, you chose a, yeah. Can you tell? Can you tell me about that with the journal that you chose, the journal article and the, the, um, the Lancet? Is that a low impact journal? Pretty high, medium? Yeah. So they rate the journals are, are scored based on what impact in medicine they have. So if you publish in the Lancet, if you publish in JAMA, um, New England Journal, that has a bigger impact in perhaps changing practice or, you know, changing something, therapeutics, diagnostics. Whereas if you publish in something much lower, like Frontiers and Pediatrics or um, PLOS, you know, those have less impact. And you, so you chose, you chose an article that was the Lancet. So this was a pretty impressive study. Um, it required a lot more critiquing and looking over the data for them to be able to publish in that, and it was well written. So there's something to consider when you're when you're going through the literature is what is the impact factor of the journal that I'm looking at for the study and the question that you have. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.